Nearly all of us can complain about the woes of winter dry skin. Tonight we're going to talk about skin problems ranging from acne and eczema to skin cancer and psoriasis. Welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Johns from the Department of Family Medicine and Biobehavioral Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth. I hope you have your questions ready for our expert panelists. Dr. Patrick Brown, a dermatologist with St. Luke's Dermatology Associates. Dr. Lisa Prusak, a family medicine physician with the Duluth Family Medicine Clinic. And Dr. Hilary Reich, a dermatologist with Essentia Health. Call locally at 218-788-2844 or toll free at 1-877-307-8762. Our medical students answering phones tonight are Michael Beckman from Austin, Minnesota, Drake Matuska of Manterville, Minnesota, and Ashley Wittrock from Litchfield, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program on skin problems. Well, Dr. Reich, in the intro it said dry, itchy skin. Everybody's got it, including me. So uh, what, do you, what do you do? I, that must be a common complaint this time of year. We hear this question from everybody. I think the most important thing to remember is that you can make your skin better. And the most important thing I recommend every day is that people use a good moisturizer. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's maybe a little thicker than they would otherwise choose, um, unscented, without a lot of fragrances at all. And then the magic really is in application. You gotta put it on every day. You have to reapply several times throughout the day, particularly for the hands. Oh yeah, the hands and the legs mm -hmm. too. Okay, well I'll remember that. Well, Dr. Bruce, I got, um, so what else uh, this time of year? Are there any other things, like eczema? Things, does that come up this time of year? Or um, hand problems or? All of the above, I think. Um, eczema, I think, can be worse this time of year because of the dry, itchy skin and the dry climate. And again, it's about just about moisturizing and moisturizing and moisturizing. Hands, the same thing this time of year, just because it's so dry. And um, so it's, it's very much very similar to what, what you've already discussed. Great, thank yeah. you. Dr. Brown, how about, some, how about some hydrocortisone cream? Let's just put that on all over and do it every day. How about that? Yeah, hydrocortisone certainly has its place, um, and we do oftentimes recommend it for certain areas of the body, but understand that there are, are better things that can be done, um, especially when we're just talking about dry winter skin, the effect of an emollient moisturizer, a thicker moisturizer, something mm -hmm. typically you have to screw the lid off of and scoop out of the jar, so to speak, and slather it on, will go way further in controlling just your standard dry winter itch than uh, a hydrocortisone cream. Is there a problem using hydrocortisone cream like day after day after day? Yeah, certainly. And you know, if you were to apply a hydrocortisone, which is available over the counter in a 1% cream, that's the maximum strength, to the same areas day after day for several weeks on end, you could uh, end up with some thinning of the skin, basically a stretch mark-like thinning of the mm -hmm. skin. Okay. Typically with hydrocortisone, um, the only areas that are ultimately susceptible are, are areas of the face, the armpit areas, and the underwear areas. It's hard to damage your skin with regular 1% hydrocortisone elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Well, Dr. Reich, I, I got another common question that people, come, patients come in with is, I've got this new growth and uh, they're worried about it. So mm -hmm. what? What do we look for when we, if we're going to be, wor when should we start worrying about something? Sure, so I generally recommend that people come in if they have something new that's growing quickly, that's tender, like painful out of proportion. Um, if it bleeds without them touching it, for example, if every night when they get out of the shower they dry their face and something bleeds, or they wake mm -hmm. up in the morning with a little spot of blood on their pillow, or if there's just something that they are scared when they look at, because that patient intuition can be really valuable. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, and Dr. Prusak, do you, do you biopsy sometimes? You buy, do skin biopsies? And, or Absolutely. Look at, and, and why would you want to do a biopsy of, of a rash? It's interesting that um, when you talk to all of us who do this kind of work, the bottom line is you really don't know what something is by looking at it almost all of the time. You can, it, 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 
all of us have been surprised in various, um, at various times when we look at something and we think, oh, that's, that's a nothing. And you biopsy it, sometimes you can be surprised. And you certainly don't want to miss a cancer um, because removing that area is different than removing something that is benign that somebody wants removed just for a cosmetic reason. Sure. I'll ask a little harder question, but that's okay. You're, you're smart, you can, <laughs> you can handle it, okay. Um, so the, the skin cancers are like, like a, a basal cell and a squamous cell and a melanoma. Now, how are they, did you, just looking at it, do you know which one it is or is that a biopsy thing always? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, clinically, we usually have a pretty good idea of the type of skin cancer that we're looking at, um, but ultimately, cancer of any organ is a microscopic diagnosis, so you have to actually remove tissue with the biopsy, whether it's from your skin or your lung, and the pathologist then looks under the microscope and sees the cells and tells you if it's cancer or not. Um, with regard to what patients can be on the lookout for, you know, when you're looking your skin over after the shower or whatnot, um, uh, generally speaking, with the basal cell or squamous cell skin cancers, those are the red bumps that won't heal, that may bleed spontaneously, that Dr. Reich was discussing. And then melanoma, which is the most aggressive and concerning form of skin cancer, those are typically the irregular moles. So moles that are asymmetric with irregular borders, multiple colors, or diameter larger than a pencil eraser. Um, and those are ones that we're concerned could be melanoma and would sure. biopsy to make that diagnosis. Sure. Now, uh, Dr. Wright, uh, so you get a biopsy back and there's a, there's a, it's a skin cancer of some type and then there, there's this Mohs surgery that's being done to remove it. In the old days, they'd just t remove it, but now there's a totally different procedure, is that right? Sure, so it's, I have to tell you, it's not terribly new. It's been around for greater than 30 years. Mohs surgery is a specialized kind of excision where I use a technique to remove the tumor with the smallest margin that I think is safe. But to be sure, I take that tissue literally across the hallway to a lab where I have a special technician make microscope slides mm -hmm. and I can check those under the microscope, look all the way around and all the way under the tumor. And then I'm able to tell for sure if I've gotten the whole thing or I've made myself a map so I can go back and remove any tumor in any particular area. So for example, if there's tumor at the two o'clock position, I don't have to go all the way around to take more normal skin. I can remove only that t tumor at the two o'clock position. So I leave as much normal skin as possible, but I still can assure myself and the patient that we're getting a clear margin. Thank you. Uh, well, let's see, Dr. Prusak, we have a caller, it doesn't say where from. A person has psoriasis, can they have a flu shot? Absolutely. In fact, they are, it's more important probably for them, to, it's important for all of us to have a flu shot. Um, but it's probably more important for them to have a flu shot because they have psoriasis than to not have a flu shot. Thank you. Another question here, uh, Dr. Brown, uh, a caller wants to know, you talk, well, we have squamous cell skin cancers. Can, can they metastasize, like uh, particularly go to the bone or are they, is it a local process, problem? Yeah, so the vast majority of squamous cell skin cancers remain confined to the skin. Um, your run of the mill skin cancer in most areas of your body, say your back, chest, arms, have about a one in 20 or 5% chance of spreading. When they spread, they most commonly go to the lymph nodes. So if you were to have one on your arm, you would expect the lymph nodes in this area to be involved. Um, squamous cell carcinomas in other areas of the body, like the lip and the ear, can have an even higher rate of spreading throughout the body, uh, upwards of 15 to 20%. Mm -hmm. So um, when diagnosed early and treated appropriately, the prognosis is excellent for squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. However, if the tumor is neglected or inadequately treated, it, it can spread and be fatal. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Reich, we have a caller from Superior would like to know, and I'll have to read this. He's had a, a problem for 10 years with an itchy left ankle. The skin color is dull gray, a little red. It flakes and the skin seems thin and actually can weep a little bit. He's been using Vaseline and hydrocortisone um, doesn't seem to help. 
And does that ring a bell at all, or is it, is it something you'd have to see? You know, I would sure like to see that in my clinic. My differential diagnosis is pretty broad. It could be that he's got some uh, athlete's foot that is infected higher up on the foot onto the ankle. It could be that this is eczema that's sort of gotten out of control and gotten a little bit thicker and intrinsically itchy, a phenomenon that we see a lot called lichen simplex chronicus that actually needs a little bit of a stronger topical steroid. It's hard to say without seeing oh, it. Oh, sure. Yeah, very much so. Um, Dr. Prusak, uh, a caller would like to know, uh, what about diet and acne? Is a, is a dairy-free diet, does that help? Or what do you tell patients who have acne troubles? Is there, is, are there di special diet? Well, maybe we'll all answer this one. As far as I'm concerned, diet really doesn't have anything specifically to do with acne. But on the other hand, it's really important to eat a good, healthy diet, rich with rich in vegetables and fruits and uh, lower in fat and so on, because good internal health is what is expressed on our skin. Oh, that's a nice way to put it. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, the American Academy of Dermatology actually has a similar stance, just a healthy diet, a balanced diet with foods from the major food groups, staying, staying well hydrated, exercise, resting. Those are sort of the personal care hygiene um, <coughs> tips that can really help lead to healthy skin and, and acne in general. Okay. Well, since we're on the subject, Dr. Reich, what, what, would you, what else do you do for acne? Um, there's a lot of a lot of potential treatments for acne. When acne is very mild, it can be easily treated with some over-the-counter products like uh, gentle soaps, sometimes stepping up to a benzoyl peroxide face wash. One of our favorite retinoid medications has just uh, gone over-the-counter, and this is a product named Differin that was previously prescribed very frequently for acne. And then in clinic, we can escalate the, the level of treatment to higher strength medications, sometimes going to uh, topical or oral antibiotics, all the way up to a medication um, commonly known as Accutane, which is sort of an oral retinoid medicine that really changes the way the skin works. But that would be something prescribed by a dermatologist. Certainly, okay. Uh, Dr. Prusak, uh, in your clinic, what else is common? What do you, what, you're a family medicine physician and, and you are the first point of contact for mm -hmm. many patients who have skin troubles. What do you commonly see other than what we've mentioned so far? Well, we see a lot of um, like warts, plantar warts and oh, flat okay. warts of the you know, hands and feet. Um, we see quite a bit of um, a, a condition called um, seborrheic dermatitis or seborrheic um, keratosis, which is a kind of a, a problem that comes up with skin exposure, age. It looks kind of like a pasted on darker lesion and people become concerned about them because they do kind of look like they're growing and they're dark colored and so they're concerned that that might be a melanoma. Um, we see a lot of actinic keratosis, which is a pre precancerous condition of the skin, um, which is um, fairly simple to treat. So family doctors do a lot of dermatology mm -hmm. and um, it can really be adjunctive to the specialists because they're very, very busy and um, um, can be kind of that, like you say, that entry point, um, that basic treatment um, part of, of um, healthcare. Thank you, I certainly agree. Uh, Dr. Brown, a caller wonders about acne rosacea. Is there something over the counter that they can use for that? Or is that something that you see, have to see a dermatologist or a dermatologist or get a prescription? And maybe you could just describe briefly, what is acne rosacea? <laughs> That's a million dollar question. You know, <laughs> it's one of the things, if we knew exactly what it was, we would have more um, <clears throat> effective treatments for it. Uh, so acne, generally speaking, uh, is, a series of events. Usually when we hit puberty, our oil production is ramped up and it's a combination of the increased oil, some plugging of the pores of the skin, and an over proliferation of the acne bacteria that leads to what we commonly see as pimples. Um, 
<clears throat> Dr. Reich touched on this earlier, but uh, one of our go-to medicines for acne actually recently became available over the counter, Adapalene 0.1% gel. Um, and I agree, I think benzyl peroxide washes mm -hmm. because they're less drying than a leave-on product. Somewhere around 5% for the face sure. is a good starting point for acne. And if that's not sufficient after a month or two, then consider changing to the adapalene gel or adding the adapalene gel to the benzyl peroxide wash. Well, thank you. Well, Dr. Reich, how about, how about the, uh, the rosacea part? Is that treated any, uh, treated any differently? Are so there other certainly, medicines? It certainly can be. Often acne, as we think about it, starts as a teenager, but then acne rosacea can be more like acne for grown-ups, you know, okay. acne in the adult population. And it tends to be also inflammatory and have uh, red bumps, occasionally pustules, but it more commonly also contains an episodic, episodic flushing mm -hmm. um, component, which we don't see like in the teenage acne. And the other thing people with rosacea can get is dilated blood vessels on the cheeks, nose, chin, and the central forehead. Um, when a patient, when I see a patient who has acne rosacea, I like to um, often use a topical antibiotic that can be very helpful. Um, I advise them to generally be very gentle on the skin, sometimes using some of the drying products that we recommend for classic teenage acne can be a little bit too harsh for the skin. Um, sometimes we'll escalate the therapy to an oral antibiotic, which helps actually from an anti-inflammatory standpoint. Mm -hmm. And then often um, adding in some laser therapy to help reduce the blood vessels in the skin can help with the flushing, um, that episodic symptom, help with the redness and take down some of the inflammation in the skin. Well, thank you. Dr. Prusak, a caller, this is a good question too. Uh, is it recommended to take a shower every day in the winter or are we actually causing ourselves more harm than good? Are we too clean? <laughs> Americans tend to be too clean, <laughs> especially this time of year. Um, really, we should only shower when we really need to shower for, you know, reasons of, you know, odor or, um, but every day is not necessary. Um, every other day, maybe some people get by with every third day. A lot of people out there aren't going to agree with that, but that's where winter itch comes from. We're oh. taking the natural oils off of our skin. Um, and we're over drying our skin by, sure. by showering and then using all the scented soaps and mm -hmm. all that, those things people tend to have in their shower and it's a vicious cycle. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brown, a person uh, calls, uh, says they had skin cancer removed from their leg 11 years ago, recently had the cancer removed again. What can they do to prevent cancer, skin cancer from recurring or returning? Well, that's, that's a great question. So I can sort of answer that in one of two ways. Um, if it is the same skin cancer that continues to recur in the same location, then I think that it probably needs to be treated with Mohs surgery, like what Dr. Reich described earlier, because that has the lowest risk of recurrence for skin cancer. Um, if it's a situation where these are multiple different skin cancers that are occurring, the most important thing to do is to protect yourself from the sun. Um, avoid the sun exposure, direct sun exposure between 10 and four. Try to keep as much of your skin covered with clothing as possible and wear SPF 30 or greater sunscreen uh, in the exposed areas like your face and your arms and the back of your hands, reapplying every two to three hours. Uh, there are, is, some other data, um, mostly from other countries, looking at different vitamin supplements and their role in preventing skin cancer. And, and there may be a role for those um, products, but if, if you're interested in those things, I'd recommend uh, making an appointment with your doctor to discuss them a little sure. bit further. And that just to follow up on one thing you yeah. said, so how often do we have to put sunscreen on? Yeah, so you should apply sunscreen um, 15 minutes before going out into the sun. Yeah and reapply every two to three hours. More frequently, if you're getting wet or toweling off, sweating, um, that's another consideration is, you know, the way sunscreens are marketed and labeled has changed pretty dramatically in the last couple years. Um, 
if you have an old tube of sunscreen laying around, you might see the words all day protection sure, right. or oh, water those, waterproof. Yeah. <laughs> sure. It doesn't really exist. Uh, they yeah, oh, so okay. there's testing's been more stringent now and they can say they're water resistant up to I believe it's 40 or 80 minutes. Oh, interesting. So, okay. yeah, don't don't be fooled by an old tube of sunscreen that uh, okay. says it can last all day. Okay. Thank I you. I have a question. Yeah. With old tubes of sunscreen, how how often should we replace those? That's a great question. Um, so first of all, if you're applying sunscreen to the cover, uncovered areas of your body, so like face, neck, arms, maybe your legs if you have shorts on, it, you should use one ounce of sunscreen mm -hmm. to cover those areas, which is about a shot glass worth. And your standard bottle of sunscreen is about four ounces. So if you put sunscreen on four times, that bottle should be empty. That being said, I know a lot of us, myself included, have sunscreen bottles laying around mm -hmm. our house that are God only knows how old. <laughs> you know, they should they should have an expiration date on them. Okay. If they don't, if it's more than three years old, the chances of it still being good are pretty low. And if you're really not sure, put a little on the back of your hand and if it doesn't look like it's the right color, or it's the right consistency, it's probably not good anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Reich, we have a couple of callers wondering about keratosis. Um, how, uh, wondering what is the treatment for keratosis and is there treatment with, with and without liquid nitrogen? Sure. So there are generally two kinds of keratoses that people worry about. Actinic keratosis, which is a precancerous red gritty spot, usually on sun exposed skin, that's from accumulated sun over time. And the other is the seborrheic keratosis, and this is that waxy, brown, tannish, stuck-on bump that seems to accumulate only with birthdays and genetics. Um, liquid nitrogen is probably the most reliable way to remove uh, just a couple of discrete spots. If a person has multiple areas where they have these precancerous actinic spots, there are other ways that we can remove them using uh, energy-based treatments like a blue light therapy or some topical chemotherapy creams. For the other ones, the brown waxy stuck on seborrheic keratoses, firstly, they don't have to go because they're not going to hurt you. Of course, nobody loves the way they look. Um, removing them with liquid nitrogen is really effective. Uh, occasionally they get cut off as in a biopsy. Um, there is a new topical treatment that's being marketed to dermatologists to uh, encourage our patients to use. Unfortunately, at this time, it's very new, unproven, and quite expensive. So okay. it's not something that I currently recommend. Thank you. Uh, well, Dr. Prusak, we have a caller wondering about, uh, and this is a different condition, it's pretty common too. What about psoriasis? What is it and what, is, what does psoriasis look like? Psoriasis looks like a silvery, um, we call it lichenified, which is kind of a thickened patch on your, on your skin. Um, it can be very extensive or it can be limited. Oftentimes it's on the elbows and the knees. Um, sometimes it can be uh, c confused with the ex you know, severe eczema or eczema, um, but it is, it's, it, it's basically treated differently. Um, mild psoriasis can be treated with topical steroids. Um, strong steroids, though, not not. It's so in that way, it's different from the treatment of eczema. But um, more significant psoriasis is usually treated with. Um, oh, there's a, a myriad of things that can be treated with, including light and so on, and and that tends to be um, in the realm of of the dermatologist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It can also be associated with um, nail changes as well as um, arthritis. Thank you, Dr. Brown. A caller wondering about scleroderma. What is the treatment for scleroderma? Her skin is hmm. fragile and it cracks and bleeds. Well, that's a difficult condition to treat, actually, and um, there are two forms of, of scleroderma. There's uh, diffuse or systemic sclerosis, um, that affects not only the skin, but also the internal organs. And that is generally managed by rheumatology. There aren't great treatments. There are some pills and infusions that can be used, but with limited benefit. Um, dermatologists generally deal with localized scleroderma, a condition called morphia, which are discrete patches mm -hmm. of thickening skin, thickened skin 
um, without the internal involvement. That can typically be treated with a combination of topical vitamin D analogs, steroids, uh, injections, and possibly sometimes pills. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Reich, uh, I have a caller here who wants to know, um, let's see, where was my card here? Oh yeah, what about the, she has had a pimply yeast rash under her breast, so been a long-term problem very common uh, condition. Uh, what do you do about that? Sure, so um, firstly, anatomy is not often on these patients' side because they have a problem where they have skin on skin all the time. So they have occlusion and secondarily they get uh, irritation and then an overgrowth of yeast in that warm, moist environment. So firstly, doing some behavioral or clothing changes to remove that skin on skin I think is really important. Um, using a, uh, a topical powder to help sure. keep the skin dry can be helpful. And sometimes using an anti-yeast medicine like Nystatin, uh, which is a, an anti-yeast mm -hmm. cream or powder can be very helpful. Thank you. Dr. Prusak, we just have a less than a minute left here, but we'll call her wondering about painful cracks on their heels in the winter on their feet. I, 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 um, so what can we do with that? Again, that's the, uh, it's moisture funny, thing, the huh? moisture thing, yeah, the okay. winter's itch. Also though, if they're real thick, then paring them down with mm -hmm. uh, um, over-the-counter uh, pumice stone and that kind of thing and keeping after them is thank really you. important. Well, thank you. We've run out of time. We've had some great questions tonight. I'd like to thank our panelists, Dr. Patrick Brown, Dr. Lisa Prusak, and Dr. Hilary Reich, and our medical student volunteers, Michael Beckman, Drake Matuska, and Ashley Wittrar. Please join me again next week for a program on circulation and leg problems, when my panelists will be Dr. Christopher Diamiorbis, Dr. Jolene Finken, and Dr. Amy Greminger. Thank you for watching and good night. <laughs>